it's um, 11 o'clock Central European time and uh, people already um, dropping in or here and more will be coming. Um, so a warm welcome everyone uh, to uh, topic two, openness and sharing. And uh, I'm so happy and thankful for having another fantastic um, guest uh, to the ONL community for our webinars, Meha uh, Bele from the American University in Cairo, a professor of practice there at the Center for Teaching and Learning. Is this learning and teaching? Learning yeah. and teaching. Okay, sorry. Uh, so, <laughs> for those of you who don't know, um, <laughs> let me just unmute. Mute all. Just mute all. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Sorry about this. Um, um, Meha is a um, renowned keynote speaker, researcher, practitioner, activist, um, and a fantastic uh, human being. And I'm so thankful that you uh, um, take your time uh, to share some of your wisdom, ideas, and practices with us. So um, thank you, Meha. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me, Jörg, and thank you all for joining us today. Um, I always start by saying assalamu alaikum, which just means peace be upon you, and it works for whatever time of day it is for you. <laughs> Easier than saying all the, you know, all the different times of day. Um, and I also always like to start by asking how you're feeling. So I'm just going to share the slide, uh, the slide deck just to show like the topic today is about towards openness that promotes social justice and share my Twitter handle. I still use Twitter. I don't like calling it X, but I mean, that's that's how you can find me, but I'm also on other social media. And I do want to know how you're feeling today. So let me know in the chat. How are you feeling today? Just use a word or phrase to tell me how you feel in the chat. I started this practice during the pandemic because obviously people were feeling up and down all the time, but I think that's the case all the time right so i'm hearing motivated fantastic hopeful hopeful is good third feeling good i'm looking forward to the session excited happy thankful also a stress under the pump yeah we can be all these things at the same time sleepy like the kitten in the picture <laughs> i wish to have your cat not my cat though <laughs> I don't have a cat. My daughter wishes, but we don't have to. We have guinea pigs. Not the same. <laughs> all right. Thank you all. So just to let you know, this is going to be an interactive session. So I'm hoping you're going to be willing to, to share with me in the chat. And if anybody wants to unmute at any time, I may or may not use breakout rooms, depending on how the session goes. We're not a very big group, so we may not need to do that. We'll see how that goes. I'm glad someone's feeling great. Okay, so uh, before we get started, I just want to have a feel. I know this is a very international group, so I want to get a feel for where you are. And I use this map intentionally because it's uh, it's different, because the actual map we use is inc inaccurate. Um, but you, you'll be able to find your country here, right? So if you can use the annotation in, in Zoom, basically at the top of your screen, it should say you're viewing Mahabali's screen. And then from there, you should be able to annotate, or you might find this little pencil icon. And when you click annotate, there's an opportunity to do like a check mark or a heart or a star or something. For example, I'm here in Egypt, but it's the same color as the, <laughs> as the thing. So I'm just going to put a heart in, in there so it shows what? that I'm in Egypt. Hmm. I'm seeing people in Europe. I'm seeing people in Asia. I'm seeing someone in the middle of the ocean. So I think that was a mistake. <laughs> Sorry, I'm struggling to use a tool. I'm trying to get it and do it. It just keeps creating more hearts. <laughs> ah, you can. You you just need to turn it off. You can do. Un there should be an undo button that just looks like a the regular undo, like an arrow that looks backwards. Yeah. And you can actually close it completely because otherwise you're going to be annotating the whole time. Oh. Well, I'm in South Africa, but I can't seem to get it right. 
Oh, sorry. You can put yeah. you can put in the chat if you want. Where you are from, if you like. And I always, you know, one of the things that's tricky, yeah, and I can hear a South African accent anyway. So. Um, I can see that. But there's, yeah, there's a few people in the ocean. Um, okay. And yeah, lots of stars in different places in Northern Europe, I'm saying. And Mediterranean. North Mediterranean. Hey, 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 hey. Serbia. Yeah. Serbia, South Africa, Singapore. Yeah, diff uh, more difficult with when you're on the phone, definitely. There is a button, but then you don't have the, the symbols. You'd have to draw it or something. All right. Thank you all for sharing. I think one of the things is a lot of times we are located in a certain place, but we're born somewhere else or our heart is somewhere else. So my heart is also in Kuwait and my heart right now is also in Palestine. So those are where my heart is. Okay. You want to add a heart in Brazil? I can add it for you if you want. Isn't this Brazil? One of these, one of these big countries here. This is Brazil, right? Because it's now upside down. It's confusing for me. Oh, it's Brazil. Great. The yellow one, right? And I'm guessing Argentina is the long one. I'm not very good at geography, so this is kind of a tricky thing for me. <laughs> yeah, okay. So here we go. All right. So just in order to move on, I'm going to actually have to delete all this now, but it's in the recording, so you can see all the variety of countries we have here. Um, okay. So I'm going to move on. And oh, I have to actually open the annotation to delete all these uh, things now. Clear all drawings. All right, thank you all for sharing. And I do want to share with you the links to my <laughs> slides. Um, so uh, if I don't know, we're talking about open education today, right? And if you haven't noticed already, I have uh, an open license on my slides. And so I'll go back just to show it to you in case you haven't seen it. Um, let me see. You see at the very bottom, there's a CC by non-commercial. Um, so this is to say that you can reuse my slides, you reuse parts of it, adapt parts of it, but don't sell them. Don't use them for commercial purposes. Um, and then what I've just shared with you now, the link to the actual slides, uh, they're also open for commenting. So you can, you, can, you can not only look at them, but you can also give me comments later. So if you want to tell me something and then you don't have a chance to tell me today, you can always put comments on it later. You can share it with other people um, and they can then comment. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to do a little bit of chatterfall. So ask you a few questions, share with you a cupcake story, do an activity called TRIS, and then I'm going to show you different models of infusing social justice throughout open educational practices and uh, talk about how do we apply um, int intentionally equitable hospitality to designing for social justice. And then I forgot to say, bring a piece of paper. And I forgot to bring a piece of paper, but I'll figure it out. But towards the end, we'll just do some quick reflection with uh, using something called a spiral journal. So my first question for you, and tell me in the chat, what nourishes you lately? What makes you feel good? Yeesh. So some people are still annotating, just turn it off. There should be an X somewhere on your screen that should allow you to do that. Personal, professional, whatever you like, Kash. Colleagues, yeah. I'm an extrovert and I'm very nourished by colleagues and human interaction. Coffee, travel, colleagues, hi Lotta. Travel, music, aquascaping, and my dogs. I don't know what aquascaping is, but it sounds interesting. Dogs, definitely, exchange of ideas. Wife, kids, little Jack Russell Terrier. Yeah. Reading and music, meditation and family, family. Long walks, me too, I love walks. Long or short. Ah, but also AI and leading the library. Yeah, I was quite energized by the new the new thing, you know. Basically planted fish tanks. Oh, okay, nice. Like landscaping, but with water. 
learning new skills. Yeah, I get energized by learning as well. The sports, oh, that's good to hear for kids. Yeah, I mean, kids can be energizing and they can also be energy draining. So, <laughs> and yeah, but mediating, I guess you mean meditating, probably church and tutorials. Yeah, growing vegetables. Yeah, growing vegetables for me as well. Very nourishing for me. I love it. I love doing it. Sunny days. I am so in love with the sun. I've always lived most of my life in sunny countries, 90% of my life. Uh, but I've become appreciative of the sun much more as I've gotten older and especially after COVID. So. All right. Thanks for sharing that. And uh, for me, community is very important for my energy. And building community is to the collective as spiritual practices to the individual. This quote from Adrienne Marie Brown's book, Emergent Strategy, really um resonates with me and it's very relevant to what we're going to talk about today in terms of open educational practices. A lot of times people talk about open educational practices, meaning something very narrow and specific that does not focus on the people and the community, whereas for me, the community is the most important element of it. So um, I don't have to know for sure that openness is, is important for you. So I'm just going to stop sharing the screen and just ask, is openness important for people here? Like, in what ways is it open? Is it important, or is it something that you don't think about necessarily? Let me know in the chat, and if someone wants to say out loud, I'd be happy to hear. I put the question in the chat, um, but I'm happy to. For people to answer in the chat or out loud. So Alistair is saying openness and most understanding. And I think that's openness in the broadest sense, right? Like just being open about your thoughts and sharing them out loud. Other thoughts? Important for building trust. I agree. Yes. For democracy to work. Yes. I agree. Career changing for me in the way of living. It's been career changing for me as well. And I believe I also agree. Like for me, it's a way of living. It's not just uh, an incidental thing. Yeah. Rachel saying, "Shall like to share everything you create, get feedback, save others time." Yeah. And likewise, I will use the attribution what others have created. Exactly. It's kind of reciprocal, even if it's not the exact same person giving and taking. And that's a, that's a very important perspective. Being receptive and willing to be inspired, bringing ideas into the world. I love this part, Miriam, as well. So it's being receptive. So open, not just in terms of giving, but openness in terms of being willing to receive things that may be different than what you thought. And being willing to be inspired rather than resisting what's new. Yeah. And for Anna, it's very important. It's one of her main values. Part of the learning process, prefer keeping things low. Okay. Important, sometimes difficult. Yes, it's not always easy, right? Except because it involves acceptance of new ideas yeah, and work. Sharing resources, future of education, future of science, the future. Paying it forward is an important part of this. Yes, isn't necessarily directly reciprocal. Allows to explore new things easily that were hard to get knowledge on before. And uh, as I was saying before we started, I co authored a paper on using open educational resource practices uh, when AI came about, because this was a time where like nobody knew much about what was going on. And so within everyone's institutions, within your face-to-face -face circles, there probably weren't enough people who knew enough about this to do anything. So it's the openness of, and people being willing to share on their blogs, on Twitter, on LinkedIn, in getting online meetings, doing free workshops. These are the kind of things that I think helped a lot of people. And being willing to share an idea that you weren't 100% sure was right yet because you haven't had enough experience to know, but you're willing to start sharing and asking questions and discussing and not shaming other people for not knowing enough. That was very important. I don't know how to pronounce your name. Vieta, I think. That's why you have it between brackets. Vieta. Vieta. Yes. A base to be able to notice things around you. Yes, definitely. I agree with that. Okay. And this is the part that relates to what a lot of you have been saying. This is another quote by Adrienne Marie Brown. And she's asking, are you actively practicing generosity and vulnerability to make connections with others and to make those connections clear, open, available, durable? And here the generosity is like you give without strings or expectations. 
And vulnerability means showing your needs. And he talks about interdependence, right? And that it's not about the equality of offers in real time. So the reciprocity, like we were talking, uh, I think it was Rachel who was talking back with me in the chat. It's not about necessarily the same person you give is the same person you get from. There will be periods in our lives where we give a lot and other periods where we take a lot. And it's about being willing to be generous and being willing to be vulnerable as well. Some people aren't even willing to be uh, vulnerable. So is anybody involved in open projects per se, open education projects? Has anyone been recently involved in one or more? I don't want to assume either way. Open network learning, so what we're doing now, yeah, attending MOOC. Open Education Week was what, last week, right? Any other thing? I'll give a lot of ideas of uh, things that I consider open educational practices as we go along. Um, okay. I'll move on and uh, maybe you will. Uh, so before, before I discuss open educational practices per se, I want to give you a cupcake story. So my daughter, she's now 12, but maybe she was nine at the time, uh, was at one of her friend's birthday parties. And the cupcakes that were there uh, had, they, you know how they print sometimes pictures of characters on cupcakes? And so we were at the birthday and she said, I found one of the moms said, did you make the cupcakes? And I said, no. Is like, well, your daughter says you guys made the cupcakes. And I talked to my daughter, like, why are you saying we made the cupcakes? He's like, because the pictures that are printed on the cupcakes, these are pictures of, uh, it was, I think it was the game Among Us or something. Um, and she had done some graphic design work and she was sending those pictures to her friends on WhatsApp. And then her friend took those pictures and she printed them on the cupcakes. So for her, she designed the cupcakes, right? And how do you think she felt having her work printed on the cupcake? Let me know in the chat what you think. Do you think it made her happy, sad, proud, angry? You think she would be excited? What do others think? Proud, offended, and or proud. She was actually really upset. And she was upset because her friend never asked her permission to take the photos, the images that she created and put them on cupcakes. And she never acknowledged where she got the design from. If her friend had asked, yeah. If her friend had asked, she would have been okay with it. She wouldn't have said no. She didn't sell them. No, she didn't sell them. She just used them on her birthday. But she, yeah, she was, she would have been proud if her friend said, I used Hoda's design, Hoda's my daughter's name. Uh, yeah, it's her friend. That's, that's not a big deal. I don't think that she thought about it. I don't think she thought of the emotional impact of it. And I think that's what happens all the time. All the time, people take photos they find on the internet and they reuse them and they don't check whether they're copyrighted. So they don't check if this person wants to sell them and they use them. And they also don't attribute to where they got the image from. And it's not just a matter of citation and referencing and not only so that we can go find it again, but there's actually an emotional impact of using someone's work without referencing them without acknowledging this. So I think that story with my daughter made me realize it's not just a technical thing. It's not just a legal thing. There's, and for me, emotions are important. Right? So it's about more than permissions. It's important to know uh, what permissions the creators intended for their work to be used, uh, but it's even more, yeah. And sometimes the permissions aren't very clear. And even though there, there's a system for them, and I think you either have done this already or you will do this soon in the course, I think sometimes it's, it's good to know how people intend for their work to be used. Like sometimes they'll say outright, outright. And some uh, places like Pixabay, they have their own license that's different from the Creative Commons licenses. But Catherine Cronin, I think, when she talks about openness, she talks about how it's contextual, personal, and continually negotiated. Some of you asked if the friend had sold the cupcakes, and that would have been a bigger deal, right? Because she's making money out of my daughter's labor of creating designs on her phone. And then that if my daughter was a graphic designer and this was how she made money in her work, then this would be a huge deal, right, to sell them. But it's a personal thing. Someone else might not be offended. And it's a continually negotiated thing. Maybe between them, they can agree on a system in the future if you want to use something that I've done. How do we go about it? And maybe my daughter will grow out of this, or maybe she'll become more territorial about the work she creates. I think for me personally, if I create something 
um, like my thesis, that's a big deal. My PhD thesis is a big deal. I don't want people to, to take that and sell it or sell parts of it without my permission. Yeah, social capital is more of a capital more, more damage more than money sometimes. I agree. But if it's like if I took a picture of the sky and I posted it on Flickr, I really don't mind it. I don't own the sky, you know, like people can take that picture and use it. They don't have to say I took that picture. But if I design something really special, I might care if people use it. So there was an Egyptian educator and author called Taha Hussein. And he used to say, which means knowledge is like water and air. And I think this is really relevant when we talk about education and open education. In what ways is education or what ways is open education like water or should be like water? What do you think? Let me stop sharing the screen. Essential for life should be accessible to everyone. It's necessary. It nurtures life. Definitely should be. Ever changes the vessel it's poured into. Yes. That's a very special characteristic of liquids in general, right? That it changes according to the vessel. So it's contextual that way. Water is a big issue where you come from. Are you from South Africa? I, I went to Cape Town for a while and there was water, there were water shortages there. Uh, it should be an issue everywhere, of course, like water is an issue everywhere, but I think more obvious than others. Oh, I didn't know that there were water problems in Serbia. Okay. Uh, and I think basic human rights. Yeah, it's an issue of openness as well. Okay. How, how appropriate for what we're talking about today. It always finds its way. And Val is talking about South Africa and change of water. And whose is the water? Who does the water belong to? Over here in Egypt, because of the Nile, and we're at the very end of the Nile, so any country that's along the way of a very long river could block our water and then affect, obviously, our, our <laughs> livelihood, right? <laughs> water is quite scarce in certain parts of the world, so is education. It would be a good metaphor in this time of climate crisis. That's a good point. Connects us all, Justin, who's the vessel. I love that. Some countries waste water on a massive scale, maybe wasting education too. I agree. Really cool. Invigorating fluid, essential, but scarce and not accessible to all. I think it's from what all of you are saying is it seems to be a thing that we think we need for life, but we agree should be accessible to all, but isn't actually, right? And, and or some people have different quality of water that they have access to, whether it's drinking water or healthy water or or whatever pollutants exist in it. So I want to ask you about the term open educational practices. So open educational practices. When I asked earlier, um, some of you were talking about uh, being parts of a MOOC, right? So being part of an open online course, if you're not paying for it, that's an open educational practice that you're part of, whether you created it or you're learning in it. Are there other things that you associate with this term, open educational practices, that has a lot of definitions? And I was curious if some of you are familiar with that. So some people talk about, I'm going to put this in the chat, open educational resources or OER. And so these are materials that are posted online for other people to use or reuse or adapt. And they usually have a Creative Commons license which tells you, yes, you can change this. Just making something available for free isn't the end of it, right? They should also make it available in a way that we can adapt. So have you ever used or created material that you put online and you told other people you can reuse it, you can change it? Or it could be on YouTube, could be a, a book, open textbook. Do you have experience with any of those things? Mirna, are you willing to unmute and share a little bit more about this? Did you create one or did you use one? Bad mic, okay. So did you create one or did you use one? Sure, yeah. You created one. Oh, can you give us the link? Is it published already? I'd love to see the one that you wrote. Uh -huh. Okay. 
مكتوب هون Enter the study of literature. Cool. And this is really nice. Like if you create something that's on the intro level, that's something a lot of other people in the world will need to use anyway. And having it be adaptable is really important because people teaching in different cultures and contexts might want to use different examples than the ones you used, right? So if you're teaching like French literature versus English literature versus Serbian literature, uh, you can you can actually adapt the examples or you can allow people to translate it. Like all of those things happen when you when you make your work open. Uh, we probably all at some point have used an open resource by someone else without necessarily knowing it. Uh, Anna saying she put some recordings from her class on a LinkedIn page. People can access it but not change or add to it. Um, oh, and Mirna also used sources from open text. So you're benefiting from open work to create open work, which is a nice cycle of things. Yes, and I would still consider it relatively open. At least people can put do things with it. Like they could take those recordings and put them inside another course, for example. They might benefit from that. So that's still a nice thing to do. And a lot of people don't have the courage to do that. So it takes a lot of courage and vulnerability to put your work up because more people can critique it, right? Usually we teach in our own class and nobody sees what we do. So that's that's, that's that. Okay. So, but the other thing I was going to tell you is all of you have used uh, open educational practices in some way or another if you use social media at all. Because if you use social media, you can ask questions and answer questions and share knowledge in an open way. Uh, it's not necessarily like changeable, but that's because we don't have to define open educational practices only by these open educational resources. We can define it more broadly as in just being open and sharing our knowledge. And so, and by the way, Wikipedia, I mean, that's an open educational resource. Whether you're using it to read from or editing it, that's, uh, that's something else. So, so that's how Siobhan and I, we talked about the self as uh, open, and we talked about openness as an attitude or worldview. It's not just the technical definitions of open access, but characteristics of open person, open self. Oh, yeah, Martin Weller's definition is, is all about uh, metaphors, that book. Yeah. <laughs> I use metaphors all the time too. I have I have a whole paper just about metaphors of AI as well. Anyway, so the characteristics of the open self, being an editable person, and I think some of you talked about this, like being willing to be inspired and change your mind uh, based on interaction with others, narrating practice. So not only sharing our finished work, but sharing our incomplete work. And I was also talking about, um, thanks for sharing there another book that you did. Uh, narrating practice is about sharing our thinking process and how we go about building knowledge and not just the final result, because then other people can learn from us as we make mistakes and as we figure our way out and not just see the perfect uh, final uh, solution. And it, is, it does involve making ourselves vulnerable and not everybody has the privilege to do that. Sometimes people are in a position where they could get harmed. And for example, I have a professor uh, in my institution called Steve Salita. I don't know if you guys know him. So Steve Salita uh, was fired from his job in the U.S. because he spoke up for Palestine when he lived there. And it was on his Twitter account. It wasn't doing anything in the university. But they fired him because of that. Uh, and he's now here at the American University in Cairo. Um, and so he made himself vulnerable, and he lost a lot because of that. He lost. He can't live in the U.S. anymore because nobody will hire him because of that story. Um, and then the other thing is the, the possibility of negotiating knowledge with others, which again, some of you talked about. It's this doing this openly so that we can all learn from each other um, and, not, um, and, and not just share when we're done and perfect and everything is ready. So, and the other thing is Suzanne and I wrote this article in 2016, but since then we thought about to make it open self and not open, not self OER, because again, it's not just an open educational resource, it's more than that. And to focus on connections to the community aspects, so not just the self and identity, as separate from the social aspects. That's important. So these are some definitions of open educational practices. And one of them is Catherine Cronin, and she says it's the descriptor of practices that include the creation, use, and reuse of open educational resources but also open pedagogies and open sharing of teaching practices. When we share our lesson plans, when we share um, how we're teaching something. Yeah, I can share that. Um, it's called Assistant Paris. 
or colonizing loudspeaker. Can someone find this article? Assist in Paris or colonizing loudspeaker. The rest of the article is available. Like that's that's a very unique title, and that's the article. If someone can find it, fine. If not, I'll post it later. That's the article about AI. I mean. Um. Okay. And then Cheryl Hodgkinson Williams and uh, Henry Trotter were working in South Africa, and they came up with this definition. And they write about the importance of social justice when you're working on open educational practices. And they say, you know, the practices that undergird the creation of open educational resources, right? Thank you, Jörg. And it's also been published since then, but the archive link always comes after. Yeah, thank you, thank you. And so, yeah, it's published in the journal Open Praxis. But that other link uh, takes you faster. It just always comes up more easily in search engines for some reason. OK, uh, so back to this. So uh, Farrell and Henry were talking about open educational practices, the practices that undergird the creation of OER, which includes collaborative conceptualization, creation, curation, and circulation, and all of that, and things like crowdsourcing, and open peer review, and using open technologies, and all the things that make it easy to reuse something as it is, or to adapt it, or recurate, or recirculate. Um, Robin DeRosa and Rajiv Jangiani talk about open pedagogy, which is often another term for using open educational practices. And to them, it's all about access orientation to learner-driven education and about empowering students to shape public knowledge, not just to take it. So for them, students be part of creating knowledge. And Thera Lambert from Australia talks about the development of free digitally enabled learning materials and experiences primarily by and for the benefit and empowerment of non-privileged learners who may be underrepresented in education systems or marginalized in their global context. Now, not all of open education works like that. Thank you for finding the other link. <laughs> um, not, open, not all open education by default will be by and for empowerment of less privileged learners. Um, so this is something to watch out for, and we're going to talk about it in a second. So as an example of an open educational resource, give us an example of students adding to the knowledge sure Val. So for example, uh, I'm just going to put a link here, and this actually has that example. So these are community building resources that uh, I worked on with some other people, Mia Zamora and Autumn Kane from the US, but also people from all over the world during COVID. And I don't know if any of you have seen this site before. I'll open it so we can look at it together. Um, it's It's got videos of us. How long do we ever have a completely original idea? I agree. Yeah, we're always building on other people's thoughts. Um, so this site was created during the pandemic. I could have done this only in my university, give people ideas for how to build community in their class. But instead, I did it openly. I worked with people from all over the world. And we all came together. People would create a video. And that's great. Okay, for some reason. Inshallah, we'll open eventually. Um, we would have a video describing uh, how it works and actually demonstrating it. Um, and we have different types of things. We have introductory activities, warm-up activities, ways to set the tone, liberating structures, which is a particular way of structuring conversations, reflective activities, and things like that. So if I open up warm-up activities, for example, and we had, it was just not the three of us, but it was people from all over the world contributing these, right? And if you open some of these, you will find people actually practicing the thing. So you see the video of the thing working in practice, so you get to see what it looks like. But we don't just stop there. We also say, here's how you can do it if you don't have Zoom, but you have another system. Here's how you can do it if you needed to do it offline and asynchronously, for example. So that's the video, explains what it is, and sort of adaptations are so important, right? Do you do it this way, do it that way? Are there resources that we can start with? How much time does it take the educator to prepare? So this was something that we created, and then it was open <laughs> for anybody else to contribute to. And at some point, uh, I was teaching a class of graduate students who were teaching English and Arabic to uh, speakers of other languages, and they contributed to this as well. It was one of their options for one of their assignments. They could have just chosen to contribute. So that's one way uh, that students can contribute to open educational resources. If you're creating a textbook about a topic, let's say we're studying AI right now, 
and you're teaching a course about digital literacies or information literacy, you can actually have students contribute to a book about AI and education and share their own experiments with AI and reflect on them. So then students become part of the process of creating a material that future students can use as well. Um, another one is related to Wikipedia. Students use Wikipedia all the time as consumers, but students can also edit Wikipedia and contribute to knowledge, right? Or if you're using something and you're in a country that the your, your native language is not English, your students can actually translate things into other languages and to adapt to your culture. It's not just about translation exactly things as they are, but sometimes your cultural reaction to something like AI is different. Uh, and you could talk about that. So for example, a lot of people talk about how you can use AI to teach language. It's good at teaching English, but it's not very good at teaching Arabic because it doesn't speak very good Arabic. <laughs> so that's, that's, I don't know what it's like in your language, for example. So if we were to talk about, is that like a UK-based example of what students, uh, open resources or just open educational resources, Rachel? It's, just, it's mostly teacher to teacher. Okay. And that's also really useful because teachers are so burnt out, right? I mean, during the pandemic, people were struggling to find ideas for how to teach and engage students who were anxious and worried about the pandemic. And so when we share, we, we help each other a lot, right? So let's talk about more social justice. So if we're doing a Wikipedia editing assignment, so let's say that you're letting your students edit Wikipedia on a topic that's related to something that you are already teaching. Where, where's, in what ways does this promote social justice? In what ways can we make it promote more social justice? You all know anybody in the world can edit Wikipedia, right? So it feels like maybe the most democratic thing in the world. But then what happens? Do you know the majority of people who edit Wikipedia? Who are they? Anna looks like she knows. <laughs> But I know her. I think her mic's not working, but, um, or maybe it is working. I don't know. Do you know the majority of people who edit Wikipedia? So the who are they? Any tell us. Chat or audio, whichever you're comfortable with. Everyone, yeah, everyone. But no, mostly white men. Yeah, mostly white men. And because of that, and they're editors, there are more women needed. There are more projects to try to bring in more. Oh, in Sweden, the most active are pensioned university teachers. That's so interesting, Lotta. Anyone can edit Wikipedia. I don't think misinformation is the biggest danger of Wikipedia for one reason, because there are editors who review the material. And if you put something that's inaccurate, someone will catch it very soon, actually. So even though that was always possible, they have editors. The issue is now that editors are mostly white men as well. And so what ends up happening, and I see Maria's uh, nodding and Lotta's nodding. The, the, the problem is, yeah. <laughs> okay, Anna is saying, we just had elections on Sunday in my country, and people who are won are likely those who edit posts on Wikipedia. Oh, really? Disaster. Oh, I'm so sorry, Anna, to hear that. This information gets deleted quickly. Try it yourself. The issue is this information gets deleted quickly, but sometimes correct information gets deleted too because they have very specific um, uh, criteria for who is a notable person that deserves their bio on Wikipedia, and it ends up being more mostly white men. And so if you try to put a woman, it's much harder. If you try to put people who are like indigenous and they don't have enough written material about them in a format that Wikipedia understands, they don't get written about them. So there's a dearth. Like, there are not enough bio, bios of women and people of color on Wikipedia because of those criteria and because of the way the editors have it. And because a lot of the people who are editing, trying to do this don't know the Wikipedia rules, so they don't necessarily do it right, and it gets deleted. And it's very traumatizing. I've tried it before to create a bio on Wikipedia, and we work hard on it, and then they delete it because it wasn't it wasn't worth it. They, they, they don't think that that person deserves to have a bio on Wikipedia. So. Um, same about topics, obviously. Oh, I didn't know that some entries are not editable without special permission. That's very interesting. Um, but anyway, what one of the things that people have started, started to do to try to counteract this bias or imbalance in Wikipedia is to have feminist hackathons where people get together. They teach them how to do a good Wikipedia bio entry and how to include more females in um, in 
in Wikipedia. And sometimes uh, Wiki Wikipedia um, branches in different countries will try hard to include more Wikipedia articles about that country in the English version of Wikipedia, as well as enlarging their local because the English Another thing is if you're creating an open textbook, there's an opportunity for a teacher. Uh, I think Myrna was talking about doing that uh, for the church that would be. Did we lose Maha now, Meha? Yeah, I think so. Okay, she will. She's back already. Yeah. Okay, I'm back. Yeah, sorry about that. No worries. Good connected. to have you back, Meha. <laughs> I could see you guys moving, but you weren't responding to me, so I figured you couldn't hear me. <laughs> okay, I'll keep my camera off. It might help. Yeah. Um. The next thing I was talking about is creating an open textbook. If you create an open textbook as a teacher, that's fine. That's good. You're making it open to other people. So it's social justice in the sense that you're making it available for free to people who may not have access to buy the textbook. But you can be more socially just by including students or by including marginalized perspectives, You know, not necessarily the dominant white Western male perspectives on the topic, for example. And the thing is, when you invite students to collaborate on, on creating an open textbook, they will probably reproduce the kind of knowledge they've always been exposed to in their lives, which is probably, again, white Western Northern type of knowledge. And so you'd have to actually work really hard to tell them, no, bring perspectives of people of color and bring perspectives of women and bring perspectives from the global South, for example. Um, collaborative annotation. Does anybody use hypothesis or perusal? Put them in the chat. So are you using them in ONL here? No, um, no, sorry. I never tried it, actually. Oh, you've never tried I, it? I, yeah. I was always intrigued, but never really work, worked with okay. it. Okay. So if nobody's ever used them, I like hypothesis. I've never used perusal. And perusal is a bit uh, predatory. So <laughs> I'll talk about hypothesis because it's open and it's free. Um, and hypothesis allows you to put comments on an article that's on the internet and other people to see it. You can make it public or private. It's up to you. But it can be a really useful learning experience when students can comment on an article and you can invite the author of the article to respond to them. And they get to see each other. They read collaboratively. Usually each person reads on their own. But when they can put comments on the article, ask questions, respond to each other's questions, elaborate, add more resources, it makes something that already exists on the internet much richer with their annotations. Um, and again, you could use collaborative annotation. It's, it's nice and it's a good learning experience, but it's not a socially just learning experience if you're always annotating things by, again, white male Western authors. Like sometimes you need to also include other authors. And then sometimes authors don't want their work to be annotated this way. So sometimes you might want to ask permission. Is it okay if I annotate your article this way? Um, and I'll, I'll move on from here. I, I don't know if we have time to do the TRIZ, but let's do it really quickly. So TRIZ is a liberating structure. So TRIZ is a, a way of solving problems backwards. Uh, to, and Usually, if you say your goal is to create open education projects that challenge, resist, or redress social injustice, we convert it to an anti-goal. So we're going to do the opposite. How do we design an open educational project that reproduces oppression and inequity? 
So you're gonna, can we put people in a breakout room of like three people for three minutes? Yeah, I'll put I'll put the links when you come back. Um, so yeah. your prompt for Victoria. the breakout room? Yeah, I will yeah. do seven, eight of them. Seven. Seven breakout rooms? Yes. Include code. Okay, so so now I'm gonna put. I'm gonna. Oh, are you doing it, or do you want question. me to do? It? Um, I don't think you made me co-host, so. Oh, I thought. Oh, I, I am co-host. Okay, I can. But do I can it. do I can it. Do it. Uh, no problem. No, no, no. I'm fine. I can do it. That's fine. So that I don't end up going to a breakout room. But uh, how can we design an open education project so that it reproduces oppression and equity? So we're doing the opposite of what we want. Okay. And just three minutes with with three other people or so. Okay. And I will give you, yeah, three minutes and like 30 seconds to come back. Everybody okay to do this? Excellent session, Maha. Uh -huh. Oh, thank you. I need to go get paper for the yes. final activity. And, <laughs> Let me go do that. My daughter just called me. That's why I was oh. gone for for. Oh, for I a didn't minute. realize. I no, didn't realize. sorry. Like sorry. she she's called from school. I is everything okay? Is she sick or something? Yeah, she's sick. I need to pick her up from school. But like, I will be right after twelve. I will be leaving right away. So um, yeah. Just you, it's okay you know. don't worry you want to make me host and you can leave now if you want i don't um, mind i wonder about the recording though then it's is it recorded locally or on the cloud it's uh locally ah, so, that, that won't she work. Can, that it's won't not work. it's not so uh, she urgent can, it's not so urgent she can wait 10 more minutes uh additionally school minutes or in the clinic or something uh, yeah, she she has great support there at the school. So and maybe even my wife can uh, get her. But um, I hope she gets well soon. This yeah, is being recorded too. <laughs> oh yes, it is. But oh well, it's well. Mm -hmm. uh, we have two seconds. So yeah. now we have the option on Zoom to. Uh, to add a room after we've opened all the rooms, and we have the option to allow participants to move to to different breakout rooms, even if we hadn't checked it beforehand, which is really useful. I think. Yes, uh, definitely in use for me. Mm -hmm. Sometimes when Zoom doesn't update, it doesn't to to make it work. Everybody has to update their version of Zoom. Yes, so. true. All right, welcome back, everybody. It was a really difficult question. <laughs> okay, I'd love to hear from some of you. Like, what is the new thing? Oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna mute this all if someone has some background noise, and then if someone wants to speak, okay. Do people want to share some of the things you talked about? Like, when? How would you create uh, open projects that? actually reproduce injustices and oppression and inequity what would you do if that was cash go ahead uh so we discussed um accessibility language and proprietary software and not having access to the course once it's finished so things mm -hmm. like for example only making it in english not allowing anyone to translate it or have any kind of subtitles or anything like that mm -hmm. using software like adobe software for example that you'd have to pay or subscribe for um mm -hmm. And yeah, like once you're done with the course, you'll never be able to see anything from it again. And that's pretty yeah. much what ideas we had. Yeah, thank you. Okay, Anna. Sure. Yes, well, we actually talked about um, possibility of, in a way, reproducing the bias that is already, uh, that already exists in our mm -hmm. educational systems. For example, um, for example, gender, based uh, bias in terms of uh, the authors of uh, the articles mm -hmm. or books that we actually uh, um, introduce uh, mm -hmm. and uh, the uh, 
uh, unconscious bias that we might have. Uh, just, you know, we're reproducing the, the picture of the world that we have because, yeah, that's, that's how we think that it should be. But in a way, uh, forgetting that there are other perspectives and probably not including um, people with other backgrounds and other perspectives in our educational setting that in the end then provides this tunnel vision of, yeah, uh, of the people, uh, yeah, of the, uh, of the group that uh, teaches. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, Anna. thanks. And Anna, did you notice that you look like Autumn Keynes, who's one of the co-creators of the OER that I showed earlier? <laughs> Oh, yeah, I didn't realize that, but yeah, I'll look it up, definitely. <laughs> yeah, I'll put her name in the chat. Um, okay, I put some links in the chat for things that I've talked about that people kept saying, put the links, uh, so I just put those. All right, so those are, when, when you were talking right now about the ways you would produce stuff that was inequitable, and you think about it, you realize that there's a lot of things in our lives that are like that. There's a lot of courses that we finish and we leave. There's a lot of unconscious bias we pass forward. So just because we're doing something openly doesn't mean it promotes social justice. We could openly promote really bad things, right? Uh, or we could just openly reproduce racism or sexism or such. Um, so so that's, uh, that's an important thing to keep in mind is that openness isn't inherently good. Um, and so I want to show you the model of categorization of open educational practices that's in the article. Uh, that we shared and I think you I think you shared uh, with with everyone um, and this one from the work of Masha you are Masha you are muted thank you sorry about that I, I meant to turn off my camera and I muted myself instead. <laughs> thank you, thank you. All right. So, yes, I remember the AI robot that was a uh, white supremacist and then they turned, shut it down, didn't they? Yeah. All right. So an open educational practice can be content-centric, like a textbook or a Wikipedia entry, or it could be process-centric. And we could focus more on the process and interactions of people and them working together. It can be teacher-centric, where the teacher is using open resources or creating open resources, or it could be learner-centric, where the learners themselves are the ones who are making the, doing the work, like editing Wikipedia or creating a course or interacting with people all over the world on social media, for example. And when we use open education, we, we can use it for a pedagogical purpose because it helps promote learning, but we could also use it with social justice in mind. And when we talk about social justice, there's an economic dimension, a cultural dimension, and a political dimension. And in our paper, we're we talk about how something that might be uh, positive and transformative for one group of people and really fixes a problem from the roots might actually be negative for another group of people and be creating a problem. And so this uses Nancy Fraser's framework. So economically, open resources, because they're free, we assume that this is a kind of economic justice because you make it accessible to people who wouldn't have access to it before but you're creating the same content. So it could be the same content that's white, Western, male, whatever. Uh, and also some people don't even have access to electricity. So even though you are making it free, they don't have access to electricity to be able to access the internet, to be able to reach it, right? But there's also cultural injustice. So if you're giving them things and the minority views are not incorporated into it, then you're reproducing that injustice. And so what you need to do is start incorporating diverse views in your open resource. And then political injustice is about who has access to design it. So in the first place, are we representing minority views or are we bringing in minorities and inviting them to design and to design the way that they want to design? Yes, I think the internet by nature is to a certain extent exclusive. It's exclusive to everyone who doesn't have access to it, right? Who doesn't have access uh, to the best of it, right? Some people have access, but their access is limited to a number of hours or it's very expensive or the bandwidth is low so they can't play video or stream, for example. So it's important to keep up that. And when people who are from these minority groups are involved in the design, then they will be careful about these things because that's what they, they work on all the time. I'm going to give you um, an example of something um, that I co-created with some others. So it's a book called Open at the Margins. And what this book is, first of all, it's an open book. Um, and I co-created it with 
people, uh, Laura Chernovich from South Africa, Catherine Cohen from Ireland, Rajiv Jangyani from Canada, who's originally from India, um, and Robin DeRosa from the US. So the five of us, what we did in this book is we tried to make sure the purpose, process, people, and product of the book were all towards social justice. So our purpose was to promote marginalized views of open education, not just the white male Western views. And the process and the people we included were people who are mostly minorities. We took work that they had done that wasn't in peer-reviewed journal and, and wasn't well known. And we put it all together and we took their permission. Do you want to use this article or something else? So they got to choose which of their articles or videos or podcasts were included. And then we made sure that the product uh, focuses only on minority views. For example, like this is an example of an open product that is intentionally meant to be about social justice and not other not just generally open and that's it, you know. Um, we're about to end. So I'm going to do a very quick activity called Spiral Journal. It usually takes about three minutes. And so we'll do exactly three minutes. And it starts with you taking a piece of paper. But if you don't have a piece of paper, that's fine. Um, you take a piece of paper and just fold it twice like this. So you'll have an X, but if you don't have that, it's fine. Just type it on a document or on your phone or something. And just for a minute, just look away from the, not even a minute, less than a minute, because we're tight on time. Just draw a spiral, you know, like, can you see the spiral? Yeah, just take your eyes away from the screen and a very small, tight spiral. Usually I'd give you a minute and play some music, but we don't have time. They should end up with something like this. So just taking your eyes away from the screen a little bit and focusing on something else is, is good. And then we're just going to use the four parts of the screen of the of your paper to answer four questions. Okay. So one question is right now I feel. Second question is I joined this session in order to. Third question is, one thing I will do differently after this is? Usually I'd give you more time, but we're just out of time. And the last question is, I still need help with. If you're willing to share one answer to the two questions at the end, like one thing I'll do after the session, please just share, like one thing you'll do differently after this session or one thing you still need help with. Let me know in the chat before you leave. And then I'll post the link to my slides again before I go. And I mean, the spiral journal is for you, the, the one that you just wrote. So you can share something in the chat. Um, Okay. And these are my slides. Again. Oh, planning to research a lot about these topics. Read more diverse resources on open education. Make sure you include different perspectives in your teaching. Investigate smarter. Use more open resources. Rethink ways to involve students. <laughs> Thank you, Yerk. Nice to be one closest student with fewer resources. Be more aware. Yerk will need more help with. Reflecting more on open resources and open practice, create more OER. You tell figure out the purpose of formal education in light of openness. Ah, that's a very good point. I think it's difficult to go straight out into the open when you're very young, when you don't have a foundation. So I think formal education until a certain age level is helpful. 
have a foundation to become an autonomous learner that can benefit from openness. So that's an interesting question. And I think, like, you know, when MOOCs came out, we realized most people are using MOOCs were actually people already educated. So you have understanding how open and sharing would work in a traditional hybrid teaching environment. So it's part of it. It would be part of it. Like where your um, online part could be more open rather than restricted. Yeah, formally it does need to be redefined. I agree, Kash. Definitely more open students and colleagues. Okay. Thank you all so much. It's one minute, what it meant past the hour, and I don't want to keep you for too long. Here are my slides again. This is my email if you need anything, if you want to follow up conversation. Thank you for coming so much and thanks for being such a lovely, a lovely participants. And thank you so much. Thank you so much, Meha. It was a fantastic session once again. And uh, thank you for contributing to our community here and uh, sharing your wisdom and practices. Thank and, you. Yeah, thank fantastic. You so and thank everyone for joining and thank participating. You thank you, everybody.